Well, I understand why everyone's concerned. We should now focus on the players that are here. Well, that, that, he can focus on the players that are here, but that doesn't mean that everyone else has to follow his lead. Better right now to dig into some biz. And Ken, we got a lot to cover with you. Let's start with some of the comments from players in the past week about a soft call out for their teams to stay active in the hot stove conversation. Many fans asking for your thoughts on someone like Raphael Devers, usually on the quieter side, speaking out. What do you think? For sure, that was the most surprising of the three. Actually, Mike Trout might have been tied with Devers for surprising. Aaron Judge was the least aggressive, in my opinion. He basically just said, yeah, I think we might have another move coming. He didn't lobby necessarily for it, but Trout certainly did. He said he was lobbying, and Devers made it clear, as the most veteran player on this team, or the longest standing with regard to the Red Sox, I should say, he made it clear that what has happened this offseason is not satisfactory. And when he said, you guys know what we need, we all know what they need. Starting pitching, top of the line, starting pitching. And they have not addressed that. They have basically said, we're not going to address that. Sam Kennedy was quoted as saying, and he's the team president. Well, I understand why everyone's concerned. We should now focus on the players that are here. Well, that, that, he can focus on the players that are here, but that doesn't mean that everyone else has to follow his lead, including those players in his own clubhouse. So... I continue to remain baffled by the Red Sox offseason and why they suddenly are not as competitive as they once were. And yes, com competition in this regard translates to adding, to spending. And they have not done that really in a meaningful way at all. Is Devers coming out saying this super meaningful in the fact that possibly they told him, hey, we're going to compete? When, they si when he signed his... 300 plus million dollar contract, they told him, hey, we're going to continue to build around you. And now they're not. He's almost questioning possibly what they told him. You know, I'm not saying they lied to him, but is that possible? Eric, I would imagine when he signed that contract, he had the implicit understanding that they were going to compete. Why would he think otherwise? The one thing that they've done consistently is spend and try. They have not gone backwards in really any way at all since he's been there. So I don't know if the conversation took place, but let's say it did not just for the sake of discussion. And he assumed, or he was told for that matter, that they were going to be as competitive as usual. Well, it would be understandable if he felt at this point right now, something of a betrayal. And that's what he was getting at. This is not someone who is vocal. This is not someone who even he said this yesterday, wants to be the vocal presence, the leader of this team. Not necessarily his personality, though he certainly seems willing to grow into it, and guys naturally do grow into it. But what he said was meaningful because he is Rafael Devers. He is the $300 million man. He is their best player. And when he talks in the way that he did, when he speaks like that, it sends a loud message. Whether that message will be heard by a seemingly tone-deaf ownership, I do not know. But his words spoke volumes. These guys are all, they want they want free agents, they want signings, because there's still some big-name guys out there. They're all Scott Boris guys. What, what's the latest and, and why? I mean, we've discussed this uh, over and over again, why. But... A little bit. I don't know if you heard the show yesterday, but like I was, I was like, teams are just getting smarter and they're not negotiating against themselves, right? They're just not gonna like if you're the Cubs and you think you're the only team with a legit offer to Cody Bellinger, and Scott Boris says, "Oh, I have another offer." Then if you're the Cubs, you're like, prove it. And so far, he hasn't been able to do that. And then also, I asked the question, you know, if a team like the Yankees goes to him and says, "Hey, we got five years, one fifty, either Snell or Monty takes it." Who does he go to first? So explain if you've heard anything, when this is going to come to an end or what the end looks like. AJ, I wrote yesterday about a number of executives who have basically commented on the fact that they're not necessarily going to be heavy in the free agent market at this point. Farhan Zaidi of the Giants said that. He said, if we can't get a deal done in the past three and a half months, why should we think we're going to get one done now? You heard from Chris Young, the Rangers GM, who said, I don't expect any additions. Ross Atkins, the Blue Jays GM, has said, yes, if we make an addition, there's going to have to be a subtraction. 
these are not men who sound very enthusiastic about signing one of the remaining free agents. Now, you ask why this is taking place. It's simple math. Boris has one valuation for his clients. The teams have another valuation for his clients. If the valuations had met, they would be signed, one or more of them. So I don't know where this ends. And the way I wrote it was one side is going to blink. One side always blinks. The big Boris Ford, the guys we've been talking about, Bellinger and Chapman and Stella Montgomery, they're all going to play this year. The question is, uh, where are they going to play? How much are they going to play for? Who is going to blink? Usually the clubs do blink. And maybe with the pitchers, if injuries occur, that will happen. But I had a GM from another club who was not interested in any of these guys or not in play for any of these guys. He told me yesterday, okay, let's say a pitcher gets hurt. A starting pitcher, a prominent one on a contending team. That team is probably not going to give Blake Snell $200 million like that. So I don't know where this is going. And every year, I, as I wrote, we wait, people eagerly await, some people in the game, for Boris to get his comeuppance. Sometimes he does, more often he does not. I don't know if it happens this time, we'll see, but it's becoming increasingly difficult to believe that all four of the Boris four are going to get deals that you would think are commensurate with their abilities. Okay, uh, so then my next question is the Bor the Boris four, fine. You know, fine, if they're going to get the come up and so whatever owners are like, we're going to get Scott Boris this year, that's fine. I get it. I understand that. I mean, it sucks for the players because they don't really have anything to do with it. But but my other question, and I asked this, you know, last couple of days is a Tim Anderson, uh, some other guys, Hunjin Ryu obviously went back to Korea. But there's some other names, Tommy Pham, that are good players. Michael Lorenzo. Why haven't these guys signed? That's That to me is more concerning than the big guys. First of all, AJ, I am not saying that Boris is going to get his comeuppance. I'm saying okay. we don't know. And I know, I'm saying it's increasingly difficult to believe that all four of these guys are going to get monster deals. Maybe it happens, but I'm just having a hard time seeing it from afar. What is going on in an individual negotiations, who knows? And as I wrote also, even though the executives are saying this, what executives say and do are sometimes two different things. What agents sometimes say and do are two different things. Now, to your question, there are a number of good players still out there. That right-handed hitting outfield group, it's Tommy Pham, it's Michael A. Taylor, it's Adam Duval. To some extent, they're being held up by Chapman and Bellinger because the teams that sign those guys, or actually the teams that don't sign those guys, might pivot to one of those outfielders. You would think they could get a deal some other way, but apparently it's not happening. Lorenzen is still out there, Clevenger is still out there, Eric Lauer is still out there. These are all competent major league pitchers at varying degrees. I'm not sure why they're not signed. Clearly some teams, and we've discussed this, have been handicapped by the question of future local television revenue and the, course, the cord cutting era and what that all means. Texas certainly has been affected. There's no question. In my mind, they would have signed Jordan Montgomery if not for their uncertainty, or at least not the uncertainty in the owner's mind. You can make the case that maybe they should go forward anyway. Arizona has some of the same uncertainty, and yet they've made a series of free agent acquisitions. So I can't give you an answer why these players are still unsigned. Maybe to some degree they're tied as well to the guys who are remaining. Even the pitchers, I guess, could be tied to Snell and Montgomery. But it's been a very odd market. Not the first slow-developing market in recent years, and it won't be the last probably. But... It is weird to see four such prominent players out there, along with J.D. Martinez, along with all the other ones I just mentioned. Ken, my last question on this topic is how weird it is to hear from certain front offices saying that they're done. I mean, I mentioned this yesterday. Brian Cashman said, we're not putting our pencils down. I respect that. I think a team like the Giants with fire anxiety shouldn't say, it's been three and a half months, so we're basically done. The Blue Jays, etc. Cool. If they end up signing one of these players and saying, oh, look, he fell to us. This all worked out. So that's what we meant. That's fine. But why even go out there and say that you're done? You know it's going to piss off the fan base. Are they that bothered about the process right now with some of the free agents that they just felt the need to say that their offseason is complete? 
I don't know the reason for that exactly, Scott. I imagine in some cases, perhaps, it was a message to Scott Boris saying we're not bending. And again, teams say plenty of things, agents say plenty of things, and go back on them if circumstances change. In the case of Chris Young, Texas Rangers GM, in my mind, and I have not asked him about this, but my guess is he just wanted to lower expectations because people have expected all offseason, and I think Scott Boris expected, that the Rangers would sign Jordan Montgomery. Their ownership is not authorizing that to happen. So in his case, when he says that, maybe he just means, listen, we're not going there. We can't go there at this point based on what our owner is telling us. Toronto, I'm not sure. Cashman certainly is still working. They're always all still working. To think otherwise is folly. These guys are constantly going at it. And yes, if Boris came to Farhan Zaidi tomorrow and said, Matt Chapman at a price, I don't know, whatever the price might be, but it's acceptable to the Giants, they're signing Matt Chapman. They're not done. So to some extent, this might be posturing, but at the same time, I think what AJ said initially is also accurate, that teams, I don't know if smarter is the right word, but they have gotten more disciplined with how they approach these things. They're at a number, they're not going beyond that number, and that's it. All right, so I read yours and Steven Nesbitt's article about mediocrity. Have the Pirates put their line in the sand? Has that is because I know a lot of people that work in that front office, that a lot of people that work on that coaching staff and players, they don't want mediocrity, but it keeps pointing back to one person, Bob Nutting. Correct. And the gist of the article, for those who haven't read it, is Nutting is not going to spend. He hasn't spent. That's not exactly a news flash. But if you're going to take that position, if you're going to act in that manner, then you've got to nail player development. You've got to nail scouting. You've got to nail international. And they haven't really done that. It's not for lack of effort. They've had some successes. And yes, this winter, they've been a little bit more aggressive than they've been in the past. They've done some things. Chapman was a fairly large signing for them, $10.5 million for one year. But Every other team in that division has still spent more. And their farm system, while having some promise, particularly on the pitching end with Paul Skeens coming, it really has not produced at the level of, say, the Orioles system or some other systems that have spit out Major League talent, guys who have exceeded expectations and become really good players. So they've got to do all that to succeed. And it's a fine line that they walk because they don't have the flexibility financially with Major League payroll to do other things. And that's the gist of what it's about. I know it's a long article, but I encourage people to read it because it does speak to a lot of the issues in today's game and not just the small market issue, which is a significant one. But in the Pirates case, there is some conflict or has been between old school thinking and new school thinking. This is common to virtually every club and they're going through it as well or have. And there's just a lot that goes into making a successful franchise. Free agency is usually one aspect of it. But if you're not going to play in free agency in a meaningful way, and their biggest contracts are, for the most part, all extensions. If you're not going to be in the market, the open market, then you better hit on everything else. That's hard to do, but they haven't necessarily done it. And you hit on the article, you talked about nuns. John Nunley being essentially let go for working with Key Brian Hayes, they're one of their superstars in the big leagues while he was a double A. I'm not sure if he was a manager or if he was a hitting coach in double A. He yeah. was a hitting coach. Nuns is awesome. And I just, right before you got on here, talked about how the Rays, well, what's the difference between the Rays and other organizations? It's the communication. If they have a double A hitting coach who's going to help one of their premier players, why not get out of the way and let him help? Not saying he needs to be in the big leagues, but let him help. This seems like it kind of went the other direction, or did I read it incorrectly? You didn't read it incorrectly, though we don't explicitly state, and no one explicitly states that he was let go at the end of the season because of his secret work with Cabrian Hayes. Both of them wanted to keep it private so as not to embarrass anyone, anyone on the major league staff. They just figured they'd work together, and Cabrian Hayes performed much better after – he did work with John Nunnally, who he'd worked with in spring training and worked with in the past. Teams usually 
Well, they've come to live with the fact that players are going to use their own outside instructors from time to time. A lot of guys do this. In fact, almost all of them do to some degree. And I don't know why this would have caused any more of an issue than any of those caused, especially because John Nunnally was an employee of the Pittsburgh Pirates. But Nunnally seemed to believe, actually, he didn't say this explicitly either, but he was let go after all this happened. He did say for sure the Pirates were upset that it happened. And I don't know what the answer is as far as why he was let go, but this certainly seemed to play a role. It would give that indication. And we quote players in the article. We didn't use everything we had either. We had space limitations at some point. And we had other players from, I mean, other quotes from other players saying this guy is amazing. He makes you feel like the best hitter alive. That was one that didn't make the story. So you have someone like that. I don't know what other issues might have been there. We never know these things. But I always think with players, with talented players, sometimes you put up with stuff that you might not like. Well, maybe this was a case where that should have been what the Pirates were thinking. Yeah, they're not the only organization. that I had people in other organizations – do the same thing and say, well, you don't need to talk to that guy because, and he's part of, and the guy was part of the organization. So it's, it's, it, it happens. It, it happens. But my, my question is on, in, in the picture we showed, you showed Nutting, you showed Derek Shelton, who's one of my favorites. And then you show Ben Charrington, right? He was the GM when I played for the Red Sox in 2014. He had three losing seasons and he, and he, won, he won a World Series in 2013. And that was a team of destiny, obviously, after the, the bombing and the horrible things that happened. And, and I think if you ask people, they'll say, hey, they probably weren't the most talented team in 2013, but everything went together, came together, right, perfectly. And great, they did it. But is Ben Charrington the right guy to lead this? Because is he the right guy to find these prospects? Is he the right guy to pick who gets the extensions? And Because he's been there for a while now, and it hasn't exactly upticked that fast. This is his fifth year, AJ. And there seems to be little question that this is a big year for Sherrington and his group. And Bob Nutting told us and he told the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette earlier that he expects the team to take a meaningful step forward. He expects contention. So if they don't contend, I assume there is a possibility of change. They had a similar circumstance when Neil Huntington was their GM before Sherrington. He went into his fifth year, I believe it was 2013, and they were kind of teetering. And then in 13, they had the first of their three straight playoff runs. And or it was, I'm not sure I have the sequence right, but he got a sixth year. Maybe it's the sixth year was the first of the playoff runs. And they stuck with him. So perhaps they'll stick with Ben Sherrington, even if this year doesn't go as planned. But it is clear there is a sense of urgency, at least coming from the owner, Bob Nutting. They expect to contend. They expect to take a meaningful step forward. And I assume if it doesn't happen, perhaps there will be ramifications. And what's interesting is if you're – Looking at this, again, from a further perspective, an outside perspective, you know that Sherrington is operating under limitations. And you also know, as I stated earlier, that when you operate under those limitations, you've got to nail everything else. That's the question. Have they really done as good a job as they possibly could? Perhaps we'll get more answers to that this year in a positive way. Perhaps some of their younger players will start to pop. Let's see how it plays out. They're not going to be in the playoff race in September. Contention's a big. I mean, if I you're, don't see it. I mean, you take you not take Dave, you take Davis one one. Mm-hmm. He better be a star, and he's not. He hasn't turned out to be that yet. No. Right, I, and and they drafted him because of this. I mean, he can hit, but they he was a catcher. That was his value, and they, they he caught what two innings last year in the big league level, played right yeah, field. The, the Pirates are part of this epidemic, and we just had Nick Crawl on, and we asked him about it because you know the. Uh, the son of of Polad, who now runs the Twins, basically said they want to be the Orioles or the really the race, right? And that's what everybody says in front of the camera and behind the scenes these days. And Nick Crawl said to us, competitive is a losing word. And he brought up the example that Kratz just said right before the interview, which was, I want to be the giant, the dynasty giants. I want to win championships. Everyone keeps bringing up the same couple teams. And the Pirates have to be in the same boat. They're hoping, oh, we get Charrington in. Maybe he can do this whole Mike Elias rebuild and turn us into a stud organization. Only a few of those work. That's true, uh, Scott. Very true. And competitive 
as a goal is okay when you haven't been competitive. You've got to start somewhere, and I don't mind that. Obviously, every team's goal is to win the World Series. That's unspoken. It doesn't need to be said. If you're the Pirates, yeah, you need to be competitive. Now, I understand what Nick Kroll is saying, and Nick Kroll is saying, hey, man, we are a team that has taken a step forward. We want to go beyond that. We want to get to a point where we're in the playoffs and doing big things. And you know what? The Reds have a chance of doing that because – Nick Kroll has made some shrewd trades. They've gotten some development successes going, and they're in a really good place. I don't know how good they're going to be, but I like what I see, and I'm interested to follow that team. So I understand the modest goals and the bigger goals, but really the question is, how do you go forward? And let's face it, the Orioles tore it all the way down to go forward. The Pirates were kind of in a similar position. They had repeated top 10 picks, and they haven't worked out as well, at least to this mm-hmm. point. Yeah, I'm with you. It's a great article. Everyone give it a look right now in The Athletic. Ken, thank you. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, guys. Fair territory out there for the world to consume on YouTube, on the FT channel, and wherever you get your pods. And there's a look at the topics this week, which includes more on the Boris conversation, Bogart's moving positions, um, Ken's Inside Dish is pretty interesting on the Kansas City situation. Hey, everybody. Be sure to like and subscribe for more content. We're back here every weekday, all year long, so do not miss an episode. The videos are coming in all day. Here's another video you might enjoy. Baseball the way it should be covered.